Won't you be afraid? Test one, two, three, test one, two, three. Sounds good.
Though you never wanted perfect, you just wanted my heart. And the story isn't over if the story isn't good. The failures never can find no way in the fathers. encounter have a seat for a moment here thanks for waking us up this morning guys and getting us going and focusing us in the right place which is God we sing for an audience of one uh, you are not the audience uh, and these are not performers these are folks that are leading us in worship and we are all together the congregation that worships an audience of one the Lord God Almighty amen amen let me share with you some announcements so you know what's going on in the life of the church and while I do that if you haven't already, please be sure to pass down the offering baskets and the, uh, the pew pads uh, with them. I think some of them are, we've discovered are, are a little low on the pew pads, so if you, if you miss one, uh, we're going to get those refilled, but uh, maybe use the next row over uh, along those lines. All right, so uh, if you have been participating with us in reading through the Bible in one year, we've been doing it chronologically. We start at the very beginning of the year. Today is the day we start the New Testament. <laughs> we, we've made our way through the Old Testament, and there's some great stories of faith in the Old Testament. There's also some stuff you've got to trudge through and, and kind of repeats itself, and they got all the list of names, things like that. But there's some great lessons of faith in the Old Testament, but in the New Testament is what gets people excited uh, as we learn more and more about Jesus. Now, if you have read through the Old Testament, but maybe we lost you somewhere along the way, uh, you got lost in the wilderness somewhere, Today is the day to pick it back up, okay? So join us uh, with starting today 
uh, reading with the New Testament, and we're going to do that through the rest of the, the year. Continue to use that guide that you got, uh, or some of y'all are using the Version Bible app. If you need a guide, let me know. Uh, you can pick up with us here and uh, on the New Testament. So I just want to make that note to you this morning. Uh, all right, several announcements I want to make for you. Number one, uh, youth are meeting tonight at 530 uh, here in the Family Life Center. That's for mid-high and high school kids. Uh, children's ministry is meeting this afternoon. This is their club M&M today at 4 o'clock for ages 4-year-old through 3rd grade in Harper Hall. Uh, we have a new Esther Bible study coming up Wednesday, September 27th, 1 o'clock in Harper Hall. Uh, if you're interested in that, contact Sherry Henry. Uh, the 6th, 7th, and 8th grade guys are invited to a Mario Kart tournament. Uh, bring your own Switch controllers. If you don't have one of your own, come and we'll share. Dinner 6 to 7, dinner and game 6 to 7, tournament 7 to 8. That's uh, Friday, September 29th. Uh, Methodist women are meeting on October 4th at 10 a.m. Uh, we've got a new Sunday school class that is forming, and uh, we'd love you to, to be a part of that. It's going to start uh, Sunday, October 8th. That's not this Sunday, or next Sunday, but the Sunday after that. And I'm going to help get that thing started, so I'll be with it uh, for a few Sundays and then uh, passing that along. Um, if you're interested in being a part of that, we're going to be using the video curriculum that we get from Right Now Media. They'll have discussion questions that go along with it. Talk to me if you're interested in that. I'd love to get you uh, signed up for that. All right. Missions meeting coming up October 9th, 6 to 7. Talk about mission opportunities. Uh, our folks that went to the East Texas Food Bank to, uh, to serve there uh, had such a great time. Several of them said, we want to do this more regularly, and so we are. Uh, if you'd like to volunteer again or, or for the first time with the East Texas Food Bank, uh, it's going to be Tuesday, October 10th from 8.15 to 11.15 information in there uh, in the bulletin. Potluck with a Purpose, uh, our Wednesday, is going to be Wednesday, October 11th, 5.30 here in the Family Life Center, and let's see, well, an October Mission Barrel, uh, since that's fixing to change up, we're going to be collecting food for the food pantry at the Mission House, and there's a list of things to get for that, uh, so be sure to pick up your uh, information sheet or your announcement sheet in there, and uh, that way you can find out all the things that are going on in the life of the church and how you can get plugged into that. Next Sunday uh, is the first Sunday of the month. It's one of those normal Sundays for communion. We're going to move communion one Sunday, so it's going to go to the second Sunday of the month, and the reason for that is we're going to be going to Parents Weekend to go see Beck up at Texas Tech, and so uh, Jason's going to come and, and give the message for us on uh, next Sunday, uh, and he always does a great job. I know you'll enjoy that. So, all right, any other announcements, anything I missed? If not, then let's stand and greet one another. In the name of the Lord.
your promises. Oh, your promises. I yes, your name is. Says I yes and amen. All your promises are yes and amen. I want to be close. To your side, so heaven is real and death is a lie. I wanna hear voices of angels above singing as one. Be near 
great I am. The great I am. The mountains shake before you. The demons run and flee at the mention of the name, King of Majesty. There is no power in hell, nor any who can stand before the power and the presence of the great I am, the great Capture my heart again. I'm 
because of your grace your fragrance is intoxicating in our secret place your love Capture my heart again. Capture my heart again. Oh. God, thank you for this morning. Thank you that we get to be here. We get to worship you together. God, thank you for your presence. As we continue this morning, God, just stay in this place. We just want to see more of you, Lord. Amen. Amen. If you would please remain standing. We're going to read this morning from Exodus chapter 16, verses 2 through 15. In the desert, the whole community grumbled against Moses and Aaron. The Israelites said to them, if only we had died in the Lord's hand in Egypt. There we sat around pots of meat and ate all the food we wanted, but you have brought us out into the desert to starve this entire assembly to death. Remember last week they were complaining? I tell you, these guys. Then the Lord said to Moses, I will rain down bread from heaven for you. The people are to go out each day and gather enough for that day. In this way, I will test them to see whether they will follow my instructions. On the sixth day, they are to prepare what they bring in, and that is to be twice as much as they gather on the other days. So Moses and Aaron said to all the Israelites, In the evening you will, you will know that it is the Lord who has brought you out of Egypt. And in the morning you will see the glory of the Lord, because he has heard your grumbling against him. Who are we that you should grumble against us? Moses also said, You will know that it was the Lord when he gives you meat to eat in the evening and all the bread you want in the morning, because he has heard your grumbling against him. Who are we? You are not grumbling against us, but against the Lord. Then Moses said to Aaron, Say to the entire Israelite community, Come before the Lord, for he has heard your grumbling. While Aaron was speaking to the whole Israelite community, they looked toward the desert, and there was the glory of the Lord appearing on, in the cloud. The Lord said to Moses, I have heard that the grumbling of the Israelites. Tell them, at twilight you will eat meat, and in the morning you will be filled with bread. Then you will know that I am the Lord your God. That evening quail came and covered the camp, and in the morning there was a layer of dew around the camp. When the dew was gone, thin flakes like frost on the ground appeared the, on the desert floor. When the Israelites saw it, they said to each other, What is it? For they did not know what it was. And Moses said to them, It is the bread of the Lord has given you to eat. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. I'm going to start off this morning with an oldie but a goodie. It's probably one of my favorite jokes of all times, and you have more than likely heard it at least once, maybe twice. But it fits this situation uh, better than any, I believe. The story is told of a man who went to a monastery to become a monk. And when he got to the monastery, he sat down with the abbot, the head monk, and the, the abbot said to him, now listen, 
we take a vow of silence when we enter this monastery. And you will only be allowed to, to speak uh, every three years. And you can only say two words every three years. Are you willing to do that? And the man said, yes. He was very serious about taking his vows as a monk. And so three years go by, and he goes through all the routines the monks go through, the prayers, the, 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 the uh, work, and, and, uh, and all that kind of jazz. And at the end of the first three years, he's invited to come into the abbot's office and sit across the desk from him. And the, and the abbot looks at him and says, okay, what are your two words? And he said, food bad. Okay, well, the monk was a little taken back by that, but he said, okay, that's fine. Thank you, go on and serve the Lord. So he did. Another three years goes by. He does all the things that monks do, you know. He goes to all the prayers, early mornings. He serves and works and all this kind of jazz and eats the fare that the, the monks eat. And the end of that three years, he goes back into the abbot's office for a second time. And the abbot says, okay, you can say two words. Uh, what are those two words? He goes, bed hard. Okay, well, that's what you want to say. You go right ahead, you know. So he, three more years goes by, does all those things. Three more years goes by. He comes back into the abbot's office, and he says, Okay, what are your, what are your uh, two words you want to say? And he goes, I quit. <laughs> to which the abbot responds saying, Well, I, I'm not surprised. You've done nothing but complain since you got here. <laughs> Thank you for the complimentary laugh. I love that joke. I think that's a great one. You know, some people think that, that complaining is a spiritual gift. <laughs> and and, and they, they're really good at it. And if we're honest, we'll admit that at times, it's us. We're the ones that get caught up in negativity. We're the ones that get caught up in grumbling. Some of us get hangry, uh, which is a mixture of hungry and angry. My wife is going, yes, David, you do, and, and all that. You know, we, we, we know what it is to grumble. Well, the story that we're looking at today is, is really uh, 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 something like this. The Israelites get hungry and complain. God hears their complaints, and God graciously provides for them what they need to sustain them each and every day. Now, of course, there's more to the story than that. Uh, God is using, or seeking, I should say, to use this time in the wilderness for the Israelites to, to, to help them to, to transform their lives from the inside out. He's not just trying to get them from location to location. Uh, he, he wants to do something in their heart. He wants to do something in their lives as he's leading them to the promised land. You see, for generations, uh, the, the Israelites had lived in Egypt. And for many of those generations, they lived as slaves. They were beat down. They, uh, they had faced hardships, they had faced the, the trials and tribulations of, 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 a, of a brutal uh, slave driver and all those kinds of things. And what came along with that were certain mindsets, certain attitudes, certain ways of looking at things, certain narratives that they had adopted for themselves. They had the mind of a slave, and God didn't want them to enter into the promised land still seeing themselves and, and, align, and, and identifying themselves as slaves. And so uh, what God does is, uh, is, is seek to get that out of them. Now, how many of you ever heard the phrase, you can take the boy out of the country, but you can't take the country out of the boy? Have you ever heard that phrase before? Raise your hand. Okay, several of us have heard that phrase or something similar to it. Well, this is what God was trying to do. He was trying to take the slave uh, uh, out of Egypt, but more than just physically take them out of Egypt, he wanted to take the slave mindset out of their hearts and out of their minds. And as we know, uh, this is something that is extremely hard to do. I love the way uh, Reverend Meg Jensta uh, describes the scene. She says, The waters of the Red Sea had barely even crashed back together. The victory song had barely faded from Miriam's lips. The Israelites had barely finished filling their canteens at, the, at an oasis with 12 springs and 70 palm branches. But out in the desert, the people of God melt into a collective toddler tantrum. It's as if they've thrown themselves on the ground. They're kicking and screaming at God. Oh, you know, why did you do this to us? 
you know, they did this last week when we talked about it, too. They, did, they, they, they had this down to an Olympic sport, you know, complaining, throwing a hissy fit, and, and, and all those kinds of things. They were, they were just, just pitiful. Now, I don't know if you know this or not, but temper tantrums are on the rise today. Did you, have you noticed this? And I'm not just talking about two-year-olds, okay? I'm talking about adults throwing walleye hissy fits, uh, temper tantrums right in the middle of airports and malls and, and, and shopping centers and, and houses and, and all these kinds of things. When I uh, was doing some research for this message, I, I, I thought, well, you know what? I'm sure there's some celebrity out there that's, that's throwing a hissy fit. I've, I remember seeing videos or snaps or whatever, all those kind of things. And so I said, I need to figure out who those people are. And so I, I, I Google searched famous adults throwing temper tantrums. And guess what? Most of the links that came up were not about famous adults, but about us adults in general. Uh, in fact, uh, I, I copied down several of the, the headlines or the links that, uh, that I saw when the list came up. Wall Street Journal reports, this is a year or two ago, uh, it said adults throwing temper tantrums, this is the title of their, their link, adults throwing temper tantrums in restaurants, planes, and at home. And then you could click on that and it had a whole article about what they did. Another one I saw said uh, adult temper tantrums, the signs and what to do. So, I mean, we're, 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 ha we're having to instruct people on how to handle these things, you know. And this one I loved, it's, uh, the next one said uh, no more temper tantrums, act your age, not your shoe size. That's good. And then Fox 5 in San Diego had a link saying, are adults throwing temper tantrums these days? A psychologist weighs in. Okay, now, we Methodists at Bullard, uh, Texas, uh, hopefully aren't throwing walleye hissy fits on airplanes because we didn't like the food that they were serving. Hopefully we're not uh, throwing, uh, you know, getting cuffed by the air marshals and sent off the plane. Hopefully... Uh, uh, we're, we're not throwing food at our servers at restaurants because uh, it was cold or, 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 or something like that. And, and hopefully we're not uh, having screaming matches in the aisles at Brookshire's. I, I don't think that's the case. Uh, but nonetheless, we still know what grumbling's about, don't we? We still know what complaining's about, don't we? Uh, to our spouse, we talk about the waiter. To, to our friend, we talk about someone we both don't like. To our fellow parent, we talk about their children's teacher or the administration of this school or, or, or whoever. We all have something to complain about. And if we're honest, we'll admit that sometimes uh, we can go pretty far uh, in our complaining. And in doing so, in doing so, when we give in to those complaints, we become forgetful. Think about this for a minute. When we give in to this complaining mentality we forget the blessings of God we forget uh, how he's taking care of us we forget about his son and what his son has done for us on the cross and we start complaining like the Israelites we start complaining about how unfair life is and how this shouldn't have happened and and we begin to sound an awful lot like the Israelites if we'd only died in Egypt you know we start doing this extreme language you know Everything was so great back then, you know. If God was, wasn't so mean to bring us here, or Moses is so dumb, or, or now we're going to die of hunger, and, and this is the worst thing that has ever happened to us. And what does God do? I, I, I think he put a, should have pulled out the old Selmer Bank and Trust yardstick that we used to face when we were kids, but he didn't. My, 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 my grandfather worked for Selmer Bank and Trust uh, in, in Selmer, Tennessee, and I still have one of these because uh, I, I got it from the house. Uh, it's a yardstick, you know, it's a yard long. Um, and, uh, but it's one of those thick ones, okay? And, 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 and we would get whoopings for that, you know? And, uh, uh, and I think that's probably what the, uh, what the Israelites could have uh, needed at that point. But that's not what God does. God doesn't even say, now, Junior, you need to act nicely. You know, he doesn't say, now what's the magic word? Or he doesn't say, you know, how, now what, can you say that in a different tone? No. In this instance, God uh, shows them grace beyond grace. And he opens up heaven to provide for them quail in the evening and, uh, and manna in, in, in the bread of heaven, as, they, as they're referred to, the bread of heaven 
in, in, the, in the mornings. And each enough for each day. And then on the sixth day, they're able to gather double the amount so that they can have food on the Sabbath day, which is the next day. That way they wouldn't have to prepare anything on the Sabbath day. They could prepare it the night before. The people of God, uh, it's, it's funny. Let me tell you a little side note about this. Do uh, you know what the word manna means? Manna means, what is it? What is it? What because they went outside, and they saw this stuff, and it looked like frost on the ground, and when the frost lifted, suddenly they were left with this flaky stuff, and they looked at it. Even we read that in the Bible. It says, what is this? Well, that, that's the word manna, and that's where we got that manna. But it was a nourishing sustenance, a, a, a bread of heaven in the morning, quail at night. You see, behind all of this, God was seeking to give the Israelite people some very practical object lessons on how to trust. Behind this, God was giving his people an object lesson on how to trust. Exodus chapter 16 is the first place in the Bible where we hear the word Sabbath. And a Sabbath is a rest. He said to them in, in verse 23, he said, he, this is what the Lord commanded. Tomorrow is to be a day of Sabbath rest. A holy Sabbath to the Lord. So bake what you want to bake and boil what you want to boil. Save everything that is, is, save whatever is left and keep it until morning. This Sabbath rest is a whole new concept for Israel. For people who were freshly rescued from slavery. Uh, and, and they had been living and had been taught and been experiencing the exact opposite of a Sabbath rest. As a slave, they learned things like, well, you got to scrabble for everything you want if you're going to get anything. Uh, they learn things like, no one else is going to take care of you. You best take care of yourself. You see, slavery taught them not to trust and, and certainly not to rest. Slavery taught them to hoard and, because you might not get it tomorrow. There may not be something there for you tomorrow. So they had this, 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 this uh, hold tightly kind of mentality they had this hoarding kind of mentality they, they had this idea that 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 we better just grab as much as we can right now and hold on to it for the future because we can't trust anybody with our future and God was saying no 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 I want to teach you to trust me not only with yesterday and not only today but with your future as well you see they had learned a narrative of scarcity and God was trying to teach them about his great abundance. They had learned a narrative of scarcity. They'd lived out of scarcity. And God was saying, no, I want you to understand me. I want you to trust me in a way so that you can know that I am a God of abundance. Now, although this morning's passage does not uh, directly mention this uh, or extend this far, the, the drama of the text comes just several verses later when, when God talks to them about just collect enough for today. Each day they're to walk out and, and, and collect only what they need for that particular day. And, and, and what do they do? Well, they still have the old mentality. They go out and they try to grab extra of this. They try to, you know, let me take a few more flakes of the, of the manna bread. And, and uh, here I got some pockets here. And, and here comes the quail and... And, you know, one quail, two quail, three little quails, four quails, five. They were grabbing all kinds of quails left and right and, and, and all these kinds of things. And, and what happened uh, when they d went to their little, little, little pigeon hole they had shoved everything into the next day uh, to, to get that quail uh, or that, that manna? Well, it turns out that it didn't last for the next day. It, it, it was full of maggots. It was, it was rotted. It was, it was just nasty. That was the experience they were having. God was providing for each day. That was his instructions. Uh, only gather what you need for that day. What God gives you for today is enough. But as we know, the Israelites struggled with this. They struggled with it because of that old mindset that God was trying to teach them to remove from their lives. Before we get to the point, uh, before we get to a place where we're pointing at the Israelites even more than we already are, uh, let's stop for a minute, and uh, instead of uh, pointing out the splinter in their eye, let's talk about the log that's in ours. You see, we too have been slaves. We may not have been 
Egypt's gyps. I don't think any of us. Uh, but we have certainly been slaves to sin. And Jesus Christ came to free us from the power and from the chains, uh, from the, the consequence of sin in our lives. Uh, but sometimes, like the Israelites, we too find ourselves with a slavery mindset. We find ourselves with a, a mindset uh, uh, of, of our old ways of living. We may live new lives for Christ, but those old narratives still live deep within us. The narrative of slavery to greed tells us we don't own enough. The narrative of slavery to accomplishment tells us we haven't done enough. The narrative of slavery to popularity tells us you aren't cool enough. The narrative to slavery to comfort tells us you aren't secure enough. These are narratives that, that come from our old way of thinking, our old way of living, our, our living in the flesh, our, our living in sin, uh, and, and they are based, just like it was for the Israelites, they are based in, in, in a place of scarcity rather than a place of God's abundance in our lives. You should grab a little extra manna. You should grab a, another quail or two. You should probably hoard up what you've, what you've got and, and, and a little bit more so you can enjoy it later. Now, here's the thing about the life pattern God had given to the Israelites. Because that's what he was doing here. He's trying to institute in their lives a new pattern for living so that it might change the internal way of thinking in their lives. God knew the power of old mindsets and the slavery narratives that were in their lives, and he responded by giving the people a chance to recalibrate, recalibrate their lives in such a way that they began to live not by the old lies, but by his truth in their lives. When they hoarded manna and it grew nasty, full of maggots, and it began to spell and began to smell, God was trying to train them with this truth. You cannot trust manna. When the people stepped out the front doors on, uh, for six days out of seven, manna spread on the ground, just waiting for them. And by doing so, God was trying to train his people in this truth. You can trust God who provides the manna. And when the people gathered up manna for the Sabbath, uh, though the manna was, was kept without spoiling, and, and when the people could, couldn't help themselves and still went out and searched for the manna even on the seventh day, God was training his people in this truth. You can stop your scrambling. You can stop your hoarding. And you can trust that what you have, what God has given you, is enough. And the amazing thing is, God did this. God provided for them throughout their wilderness experience. And because God knew that slavery narratives and the slavery mindset, mindset had wounded his people, God put in place these practices so that every day these truths were being reminded to them. If they tried to hoard manna, it would go bad. Manna isn't the thing I should be placing my security in. If they, if they walk out, they see that God has provided them something. God is the one that provides what I need for each day. These truths that God was doing in their lives, every day they were being reinforced. Every week they were being reinforced. You know what? It is these practices that were slowly changing the mindset of these adults and their children. In the same way, there are practices that, that God wants us engaging in so that over time it continues to not only shape our mindset into a mindset that is Christ-minded and not slavery-minded, but also that, that, uh, that help to instill those practices for when outside influences try to, to shape and mold us elsewhere and lead us in other directions, these practices that we can be doing today are the things that keep us grounded in what is truth. What am I talking about? I'm talking about daily prayer. I'm talking about daily living in God's Word, reading the Scriptures. I'm talking about uh, uh, weekly worship together. I'm talking about monthly communion together. I'm talking about accountability with brothers and sisters in Christ. I'm talking about encouraging one another in the faith. These are all spiritual practices that God wants us to engage in so that that as we go through this life, and sometimes people call this life a wilderness, we can, 
we can remove from us, Charles, by, or God can remove from ourselves those old ways of thinking and shape us into the people who have a Christ-like mindset. You see, daily they learn that you cannot trust manna. Daily they learn that you can trust God who gives the manna. And every week they learn God's provision is enough. And I can rest in that. You see, Sabbath was given to the Israelites as a gift of truth to counteract the false narratives of the world around them. Sabbath is still given to us today for this same purpose, to reinstill in us, to recalibrate our lives every single week that we take that time off for God. We come together for worship. We take a day of rest away from our work. We learn that we cannot trust our jobs or our accomplishments, our skills or our financial securities. None of these things last forever. None of these things are going to save us. We still need to learn that, to trust the God who gives us the manna of our life, the bread of life in our life. The journey through the desert wasn't always easy. But the, but the Israelites learned that God was a guiding God. And we can learn that same truth. The journey through our lives is fraught with perils and most of us concerning the manna that we've come to rely upon. But, but what we need to learn daily is how God is always guiding, God is always providing, God is always loving, God is always strengthening. And most of all, we learn this through a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. Not a every so often relationship, but a daily walking with the Lord, engaging in spiritual practices that put us at the feet of Jesus each and every day. The Israelites spent 40 years in the wilderness tempted by uh, uh, false narratives. And, and God spent 40 years in the wilderness teaching the Israelites these truths. After the Holy Spirit came and lighted on Jesus at his baptism at the Jordan River, uh, he also sent Jesus into the wilderness, not for 40 years, but for 40 days. And Satan also tempted Jesus in those same ways, with false narratives, with lies. He said, listen, Jesus, provide for yourselves rather than trust. Do a miracle and set yourself apart. Get to the end result of your ministry without having to go through the suffering or the cross. And what did Jesus do in each and every one of those cases? He held fast to the truth. He quoted scripture to the devil and spoke truth to the midst of the devil's lies. In the wilderness, Jesus is our truth. God's word is our truth. Jesus embodies that word of God for us. Jesus is the bread that will sustain us. And so we know then that we can trust God's provision. Jesus is our haven of rest from temptation. And we can trust in him. I want to conclude by uh, talking once again real briefly about the recalibration of truth. These are the three things I want you to take home with you today. I want you to remember, number one, say it with me, God has provided enough. Number two, Jesus is more than enough. And number three, hidden with Christ in God, we have enough. Would you pray with me? Gracious Lord, sometimes we find ourselves scrambling. Scrambling for, for what we think we need in life. Uh, Lord, possessions. Uh, positions, powers, pleasures, whatever it may be, we think this is going to be the thing that sustains us, and and uh, and and we start to try to hoard those things, Lord, and and we we realize that uh, they don't satisfy, they don't fill the hole in our hearts. Nothing can. There's not a person that can fill the hole in our heart. There's not a a drink that can fill the hole in our heart. There's not a not a a, a, a job description or anything. But only only you, Jesus, can fill that void in our lives. Only you can fill the hole in our hearts, oh God. And so help us to rest in that. Help us to allow you to have your rightful place on the throne of our heart of hearts. Help us, Lord, to uh, trust you. Help us to, uh, to rely on you and what you provide for us each and every day. Let us not try to run ahead and get all worried and fuss about tomorrow or are fearful of our past. But Lord, let us find you in the day. Trust you to be enough. We go forward in faith.
the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. And God's people said, Amen. So thank you for being with us here today. And uh, if you are so moved by God and you're ready to, to publicly profess your faith in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, we want to celebrate that with you and, and welcome you to come down as we're singing our closing song this morning. If you have already done that, and uh, uh, you are now, maybe you've been coming for a little while to this church, you're ready to become a member of Bullard Methodist Church. Uh, we'd love to sit down and talk to you about what membership means. Uh, I'd like to share with you the vision of the church, talk to you about how you can get plugged in. So please be sure to uh, give me a call this week or talk to me at the service today. And, uh, and we can find a time when we can get together and, and meet about those things. If you need the, this altar, you're welcome to come forward. Uh, we've got pillows down here you can use to kneel on. Or if you just want to stand and we can join together in prayer down here, I invite you to do that as well. Let us stand together as we sing our closing song, As the Deer. As the deer panteth for the water, so my soul longeth after thee. And you alone on my heart's desire. Brothers and sisters in Christ, uh, it is uh, with great joy uh, that I, I get to introduce Erica to you. And some of you all have already met her, uh, but she has walked down this morning uh, taking a bold step of faith to say, God, I need to recommit my life to you. Uh, I need to receive Christ afresh and anew in, in my life. And so, Erica, we celebrate that with you today. You are a child of God. Uh, you are a disciple of Jesus. Your, your life has been made new in Christ today. Your sins are forgiven, and you go forward in faith today. Amen? Let's celebrate that right here. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. I'm going to go out and talk to you. One other thing before we go this morning, I'm going to ask Nancy Bishop to come down to, uh, to the front, if you don't mind, Nancy. Come on down here. Nancy uh, is, uh, is, going to, uh, is going to be leaving us. She is, uh, she is moving uh, to be closer to family. Remind me where it's going to be, Nancy. Tallahassee, Florida. So she's going to be a, 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 a beach uh, person, huh? No? no? Just, a Floridian. just a Floridian. Okay, okay. <laughs> and so as is our tradition here at, at Boulder Methodist Church, we'd like to do a prayer and sending for folks so that she knows she goes with our blessings uh, and that, uh, that we will miss you and that we love you and that we will Always save a seat for you if you come back into town, okay? So let's uh, let's have a prayer for her. I invite you to extend the hand uh, as if you're surrounding her in love, and uh, let's pray for Nancy. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for uh, for Nancy's time with us here at Bullard Methodist Church. Uh, we thank you, Lord, uh, that you have been active in her life and and have walked with her through difficult times, uh, but also times of great joy and peace. And now, Lord, you have directed her life in a way that you are, you are calling her to Tallahassee, Florida, Father.
And we pray, Lord, that uh, you would go on ahead of her and prepare that place and space for where she's going to be living, her new friends, her new church. Help guide her to those people in that, that place of worship so that she can continue in her faith journey and can know uh, that you are with her. And as she is in Tallahassee, Lord, may she be reminded on a regular basis that there's a family of faith here that loves her and is supporting her through their prayers and would love a phone call to see how she's doing every so often, Lord. So thank you so much for Nancy and her time here. We look forward to hearing great things about what you're going to do in her life in Tallahassee. And we pray all these things in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen? Amen. We love you. I'll let you head on back there and make sure to hug her neck and, uh, and Erica's neck as well. Would you receive now this benediction? Go forth from this place of the children of God. Children who live in the fullness of Christ. Not your own power, not your own strength, not your own way, but God's power, God's strength, and God's way. Go in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen? Amen.